Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiologist, and I'm a nutritionist, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Hey, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson. I'm the owner of Extreme Human Performance, and actually now an instructor at Rocky Mountain University online, and a faculty cool. member at the Kerrig Institute for Functional Neurology, and right now I'm in South Padre, Texas. Nice. You know, this will make yeah. you feel good. I think it's 21 degrees in Ohio today. So, oh, we yeah. had a, a northerly come through here. They got cold, so it got down to 55. <laughs> oh, well, I can only have so much sympathy. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's I actually, to be back in the low 80s today. Oh, nice. Yeah, I actually yeah. left my back window cracked in my car at work, and there was snow on the seat. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, no. Anyway. All That's right. Fun. Okay, let's. We're going to cover some listener mail, everybody. Today, it's just going to be Doctor Nelson and myself. Phil's at his big meet, uh, and then we're going to talk in the topic of the day about um, good genetics, specifically good genes for what. So you often hear, "Oh, she's got good genes. He's got ge- good genes." Well, to anybody in the biological sciences, you're thinking, "Well, for what? Like genes for what?" So that's what we're going to talk about. What kind of Expression, you know, what proteins are expressed, but not so much on a huge, like, metabolomics kind of thing, but just, you know, what are some of the biological systems that could be benefited? What kind of phenotypes actually do you see when people have, quote, unquote, good genes? So, uh, first to the mail. Um, This first one was really nice. I just got this uh, day before yesterday uh, from Nate. He said... um, I just wanted to take a moment to personally thank you guys for the info you provided on the keto slash TBI discussion on Iron Radio a few weeks back. I found some great studies and an abundance of info from your recommendations. It's really great that you guys share your knowledge so openly and in such detail. Not something you see anymore. I honestly can't say enough, enough good about you guys and the podcast. I have to mention that none of the doctors that my brother has seen, from MD to witch doctor, uh, ever <laughs> <laughs> he's really been looking, ever mentioned looking into creatine. Um, wow. We looked, I'm sorry, we learned more in a few minutes from you guys uh, than he has in the past five years through the standard medical path. I can't thank you guys enough. So that was really nice. Oh, thank very you. nice. Right. And uh, Mike, I think that was, you were the one bringing up the creatine thing, and of course, we got turned on to, or at least re-emphasized to a lot of that yeah. creatine and neurological function stuff because of the talk we saw from Mark Tarnopolsky, right? World-class research. Yeah, totally. Uh, but yeah, good stuff. Now, it, it's worth pointing out, and, and I think Nate knows this, but we we're, we don't give medical advice. We're just yeah. turning on people in an informational way, but I'm glad to be able to help because I do think one of the things that we do have going on with Iron Radio is our variety of of perspectives. I mean, Mike is constantly traveling and absorbing info. You know, we, we do research ourselves. Phil's practicing in the gym, so he has, he's got just a, a huge wealth of that sort of journeyman knowledge. Uh, so, yeah, I do think we can provide information pretty well, and maybe even better than some physicians, right? Because not all physicians are completely up on the lit- most recent literature or other health professionals, and so, good. I'm glad we could help with that. Uh, the next couple are actually from Instagram. I thought I would bring up some of this. I'm trying to be better about Instagram. Uh, we have uh, our intern, current intern, working in Iron Radio, like Twitter feed and, uh, and Instagram page and that kind of stuff. Now, she's a grad student, so she's busy too. But, you know, just trying to spread the word. I've got my own Instagram page now. It's just Lonnie Lowry. But anyway, here are some comments that I thought were, were fun from there. This first one, let's see. Um, from B-R-3-N-D-O-N-L-A-N-D, uh, Brendan Land. He said, hi, Lonnie. Um, 
Kent Langston and I are molecular metabolism scientists at Harvard and recreational mm. bodybuilders, huge fans of Iron Radio. Uh, now, this is a little bit dated. He said, we'll be at the New York Coffee Festival on Saturday. Hope to see you there. So, uh, sorry, man. We Obviously, I didn't catch up with you there. I wonder if you were able to successfully master that. Um, they had a strength actual event, one of the booths where you had to hold um, this canister of water up by your chin and you see how long mm. you can hold it and i forget how many kilos it weighed but the whole idea is the coffee festival the proceeds of that went to a water charity clean water for developing countries and mm. that's one of the reasons it really drew me there obviously the coffee did but it was also the charity aspects and and uh so when i did it i actually set the record but then i tried to be good and i'm no i'm not some very strong person i, I was never really just about the strength but uh, when I, when it dropped below my collarbone, I'm like, okay, I don't think I'm I'm meeting this lift anymore. You know, I'm not. I don't feel like this is successful anymore. Should I set it down? And the one girl's like, yeah, go ahead. So then they took the time. Later, some guy passed my time by holding the damn thing at his belly button, and I'm <laughs> like, bring in the powerlifting judges because damn. <laughs> now it's all for what charity. What federation was this, Lonnie? What's that? <laughs> What federation was this? Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> so obviously I'm not salty because, you know, you, you give five bucks and it goes to the, you know, further, in you know, input into the charity and whatnot. But I did think, huh, well, <laughs> different judges, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to be <laughs> noble, you know, and this guy hands my ass to me uh, by holding it at his belly button. And, you know, I, I drop it below my collarbone and I'm like, oh, I, you know, I want to be honorable. That's – I think I should end. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but anyway, I <laughs> – I hope that the, our our friends at Harvard here um, redeemed me. <laughs> there we go with a good lift. Uh, anyway, so so that, that's fun. The next one is let's see. Skepsis M says currently listening to your coffee festival bit, and I had to share my little video with you. Uh, he he sent along the video. I've been using an Italian coffee maker for a few years now, and it's the greatest cup of coffee every time I make it. So um, maybe I could try to uh, reshare that. I really don't know how to use Instagram very well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I know a lot of our listeners dig the caffeine and the coffee. So uh, thanks for that comment, Skepsis M. Uh, this next one, he's made a couple of comments over the last several weeks or a few months that I've been on Instagram. Uh, Ed Fuchs Music. He says, I've been reading T Nation and training for over a decade, and Iron Radio is pretty much the only thing that's like a breath of fresh air. I really enjoy your work. So, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ed. I've had some interaction with him, and he signed up for the new certification I was doing, so thank you very much. Right on. Yeah, sort of a renaissance man, right? If I'm assuming that he's a musician and a science advocate, you know, we need yeah, more. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, need more people like that. So, good stuff. Uh, let's see. Science news. You said you had um, caught whiff of something new with the, the ketone supplements. Is that right? Strength and muscle sport news. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a shout out to uh, Chris Kelly and Dr. Tommy Woods at Nourish Balance Thrive. They're the ones who uh, let me know about this. Uh, they actually have a pretty cool interview with one of the researchers there, too. But it's... So right now on the market, up until now, you can get exogenous ketones, but basically only in one form. So they take the ketones, so BHB, so beta-hydroxybutyrate, and they bond it to different types of salt, which you can then consume, and then it shows up as BHB or the ketone in your bloodstream. So on one hand, I find that absolutely fascinating that we can put some into a uh, "Quote unquote nutritional ketosis, right? By increasing their ketone levels, um, the salts may have a limit just due to the gastric absorption, right? So they they now try to sometimes they'll split it out over like four salts, what they call a quad salt. But at some point, if you're trying to get a, a super high level, you're limited by the the gut absorption and, and dumping so many salts into it. So for research, they had other versions that were ketone esters." So some of this originally was developed by uh, Patrick Arnold through Dr. Dom D'Agostino's lab, uh, doing some military work, you know, looking to see for oxygen toxicity for divers that use, like Navy SEALs, that use non-rebreathers. 
so they don't want any bubbles or anything like that to show up. So could they give them something that would you know, possibly reduce the risk of oxygen toxicity? And so they've been investigating different types of ketone esters, which have a little bit different properties. You can do things with the other types of ketones possibly, and you can get higher levels. So I actually checked into about a, oh man, it's been going on for probably a year and a half ago, looking at can we use a ketone ester maybe as a pre-workout or performance enhancing supplement. And the short version on that is that the couple companies said, oh yeah, it's going to be on the market any day now. It's, it's what they call grass safe or generally regarded as safe. But up until just a couple days ago, none of them were on the market as a supplement. Uh, but now there is one that is a ketone ester uh, from a company called HVMN. And you can buy it now, so far, um, just quote unquote over the counter. Um, it's interesting though, if you look at the research, so the research on it does show that with this particular one, which is an ester form, you can get super high levels, right? So they're showing that you can get at least around three millimolars of, uh, basically measurement of ketosis, right? So you're just measuring how much of it is showing up in the blood. So much higher than you can get with a salt. If you look at what the performance data is, though, uh, it's kind of mixed, right? There's only really like two studies on it. So like the main study that came out on it was in a great journal, so Cell Metabolism. Uh, Kieran Clark is the, the lab. The main author is uh, Pete Cox. This is from uh, Richard Veach's lab, that area. And the short version is they did use carbohydrates in the study also. Pretty high level of trained athletes. And if you boil everything down, they did show a, a pretty big bump in performance in terms of, you know, higher end elite performance. Still in the single single digits, but, you know, for people on the elite scale, that's that's pretty damn good. Realistic, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's realistic. It, you know, it doesn't really, it's definitely out there in terms of, wow, that's pretty impressive, but it's not so impressive that you're like, that's bunk, <laughs> you know? Right. It's not that far out. Um, and then just a couple of days ago, the, the full version actually got released. Uh, first author is Leckley. Uh, this is from Louise Burke's lab. Uh, ketone diester ingestion impairs time trial performance in professional cyclists. Mm -hmm. So again, super high level athletes. They tried to do something similar. They, they gave them carbohydrates in addition to ketones and everything else. And again, if you boil everything down, they didn't show a performance boost. So, I don't know. I mean, the first study was, you know, if you read the disclosures, sponsored by the lab that does produce the, the ketone. Uh, the other one was not. Again, that doesn't automatically mean that it's it's bad. I mean, obviously, cell metabolism is an extremely reputable journal. I mean, the study, when you read it, appears to be very well done. So... Yeah, so I think it'll be interesting. Um, the downside is that it is extremely expensive. Oh. So for one little container, which again, n no one is really sure exactly how much you need for dosing or whatever, 33 bucks still. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, but at least on the uh, metabolism side, I find it fascinating, especially if you look more at uh, possible neurologic issues and things of that nature. I think it may be more beneficial for that than just strict performance. Yes. And it's, I don't think it's going to show performance benefit, especially when you're talking more elite athletes and you're getting close to that speed and power range where carbohydrates are the primary fuel. Yep. Um, now, if you're doing like ultra endurance events or you're doing things where you have to carry all your own food and stuff like that or more moderate type events, eh, I think you, we might see some performance benefits there, although there's not a lot of research in that area. So, yeah, but yeah, if people want to go to the nth degree and, and play around with it and have some money to burn. I, I may buy some just to try it for the hell of it, but yeah, yeah uh, I was spend. actually just thinking about a student project. Maybe I can score yeah. some and, and look into that because let me put on my curmudgeon hat for a minute actually sure. actually i'm always a curmudgeon <laughs> but, i was gonna uh, say do you ever take it off right let me <laughs> let me secure it to my head even more uh this 
reminds me quite a bit of like the medium chain triglyceride thing years ago, yes. right? They tried to give it to athletes. They thought, oh, it's, it'd be more water soluble, fast acting. We'll mix it with some carbohydrates, you know, um, almost like a gator, a spiked Gatorade kind of thing. Um, and then they wrote it off, right? So back in the probably in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, they sort of wrote off medium chain triglycerides because if you get more than maybe, you know, one to two tablespoons, you end up with diarrhea, like osmotic diarrhea. It's nothing toxic. Mm -hmm. but uh, And then like, oh, so it, that wa that was a wash. It didn't work. And since then, I've tried to, anytime I wrote a, a chapter in a book or something or a, a review paper on dietary fat, I would bring up that, hey, there are other uses for these very uniquely digested and metabolized medium chain fatty acids, right? And so it's the same thing that you're talking about. Like instead of just trying to feed a high-performing athlete who is really crossed over to carbohydrate and glycogen use, you're trying to almost force feed the machine. What about some of the other benefits? Like MCTs, I think, are still a great, for lack of a better way to put this, clean-burning calorie source, right, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. A lot of the Japanese research suggests that they're, they might be better for, uh, you know, less likely to be stored as fat, for example, just because of the way that they're digested and metabolized. You know, gastric lipase is a better yeah. player and, and this and that. And, but it's the same thing with this, right? Like you were saying, how much of this could have neurological benefits? Yeah. And now, so here's my question for you then. When it comes to things like, you know, we hear everything like Fred Hatfield talking about the anti-cancer effects of a very low carbohydrate, like a nutritional or a metabolic ketosis, really. Um, how much of the mechanism do you think, I know a lot of this is unexplored, I'm asking you to speculate, would be carbohydrate absence versus the actual presence of the ketone bodies in the blood? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not a cancer researcher. I would you know, refer you to Dom or other people that I know that work in, in his lab or other labs. But so initially, you know, the, the, the main theory is that, you know, cancer only runs on carbohydrates, right? So the, the, the main theory was that you're exploiting the metabolic flexibility of the body to switch fuel sources and quote unquote, starve your cancer. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's obviously way over simplistic. There are some types of cancer that can run on other fuels, so that's a little bit oversimplistic. Um, probably depends on the type of cancer, but yeah, up until now, your point is correct that we couldn't differentiate those two, right? So if you wanted to get uh, super high levels of ketones, right, so if we just do a, a BHB measurement of your blood, which you can get the little sticks and do at home, that you had to do that by dramatically lowering your carbohydrates, right? There was no other way, like you either fast or you get your carbs super low, your fat relatively high, and that's how you get into ketosis. There's, there's no other way around it. Um, now I think it's interesting from a research standpoint, we can take someone and we can kind of separate those out a little bit, right? We can give them a supplement and we can push up BHB levels or other ketones possibly higher <clears throat> and we can even do it like in those two studies in the face of higher carbohydrates also. So from a mechanistic standpoint, maybe it allows you to kind of play around with variables a little bit more <clears throat> and figure out exactly your question. Is it the super low levels of insulin or is it, you know, more the exogenous ketones? Is it a combination of both possibly? Um, one of my concerns, though, and I was on a panel at ISSN with, with Dom and a couple other people about three years ago, I think it was two or three years ago, that if you look at the body, whenever insulin is high, <coughs> ketones are low, right? Because insulin is going to check you know, how much ketone production you have in a healthy individual. So you're not going to get ketoacidosis or anything like that, no matter how hard you try with your diet. Well, now we can kind of circumvent that a little bit, right? You can take ketones on top of a high carbohydrate meal yeah and to me that just seems like a bad idea you know maybe you get away with it in an athlete who's cycling through so much fuel that it doesn't matter that much but to the average person to say oh yeah just go take some ketones now after a meal ugh, that just i i don't understand the the logic behind that yeah it's i guess i consider it topic 
consider it less bad as Uncharted, you know? I mean, like... Uh, yeah, not bad, just Uncharted, right? We just don't know, and we do know that when that shows up historically, it's not good, yeah. right? And again, we're talking about massive differences in in levels, you know, compared to uh, what you can get from Assault and that kind of stuff, so... Yeah, right, right, yep. I agree. We <laughs> may find that the Assault just doesn't bump them up enough to really have anything to worry about, but it... I don't know. So the athletes that I work with, who I have used some uh, MCTs, uh, C8 has a little bit less of that osmotic effect. Right, so you can get yep. a little bit higher dose. Yep. Um, I have had them use like a salt for more fasted type training. So trying to increase that sort of fatty acid end of the spectrum. Maybe we get some you know machinery that gets upregulated that transfers after that. Again, we don't know yet, but I'm not a fan of just hey, just take this with every meal. Right. Yeah, I admit the bodybuilder mentality is uncharted. That's edgy and cool. <laughs> instead yeah, of, yeah, I know. <laughs> instead of, well, that could also be very bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, I didn't mean to be. Uh, I didn't mean to focus too much just on cancer because the neurological stuff is also an area. Right when we talk about some like um, yeah. old school dietetics, even is about using. Uh, ketotic diets for different neurological disorders. So also on the neurological front, it's very interesting, right? Because, for example, you might hear that the unadapted average person, your central nervous system runs on glucose, but then fat adapted people, you can kind of force your brain to run on ketones. And, you know, so there's also the neurological front as well. And again, I don't want to belabor this too much because we have discussed this off and on over the months, but yeah. it is fascinating. Oh, that, totally. Yeah, you could put the body in a situation that is completely unknown to it when it comes to like evolution like you yeah you can be in a high blood glucose high uh, blood insulin state and have a, a ketones <laughs> all yeah. you know plentiful now your body it, yeah it's like oh okay i have these two fuels here that usually aren't mutually present you know and then what's going to happen you know yeah. and so it's it's it is sort of fascinating to me uh, in that way. So, yeah, we're just going to have to see where a lot of this goes. I'm curious, again, to look at, just like with the MCTs, what might be some applications for this other than just like high intensity cycling performance, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and by the way, listeners, if, you know, we're, if you're like, what's these, you know, Dr. Nelson's going on about C8 and this and that. Medium, the, the link between the ketone bodies and the different length fatty acids is, of course, is that ketone bodies are essentially partly broken down fatty acids, right? So most people, if they're not diabetic because of the, they have some background insulin functioning, they're not going to become so ketotic that they become acidotic, right? And even yeah. now, you'll talk to some nurses and dietitians. They'll say, oh, those cyclic ketotic diets, those are dangerous and they're acidotic. No, I mean, I learned that from Jeff Volek years ago. Right. Again, low yeah. carb researcher that, hey, you can't an average person is not going to become so ketotic by eating very low, like 50 grams of carbs a day or something like that, that they they are acidotic and it's dangerous and catabolic to muscle tissue and all that kind of stuff. You know, so the people who like that stuff. And again, I think it's maybe genetic uh, the way people respond to some of these things better than others, which is sort of our topic of the day. But no, that's cool stuff. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. And last quick point on that, and we'll move on, is that to me it's just beyond intriguing that you can take the average person who's probably never been in ketosis in probably their entire lifetime. If they don't, let's say they don't even exercise, they eat you know fair amount of high carbs, and if we force them to fast for a long enough period of time, their body would switch to using ketones. It's like that pathway is so conserved that you may have not have exercised it for 50 years of your life but I've never seen it reported where yep only made it a four-day fast couldn't use ketones dropped dead in his apartment <laughs> right know? that reminds me of Cass right Cass Forsyth who yeah brilliant um, background right exercise phys and nutrition she's got a lot of mm -hmm. actually similar to, to my academic background worked in Jeff Volick's lab and I remember yep. her lamenting I can't get into ketosis. I'm eating like 40 grams of carbohydrates a day or yeah. something ridiculously low. And and she's clever enough. I don't just I don't think it was simply that she was eating too much protein, right? Because protein yeah. can be so glucogenic. I think that's where a lot of people can't get into ketosis cuz the the lifters can't let go of the protein and it's kind of hard to do that. But yeah, it it was very difficult for her to do that. Um I forget how she jump started it. 
Um, I think she just started doing a. I could be wrong, but I think she started doing a fast and just started drinking pure oil. <laughs> I yeah, could yeah. be wrong, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you, I used to hear from my old nutrition professor that in dietetic settings for neurological disorders, they would give uh, like butter balls or coconut fat yeah. balls. Like they would roll butter in coconut and say, here's what you're eating today. You know, it's yeah. so fatty. Um, yeah, so interesting. It's interesting stuff. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, let me share one last thing. Since I just got this in my in inbox, the Natural Products Insider people, um, they are offering a, it looks like you can download this white paper that discusses ch tart cherry. So okay. it says, from sports nutrition and sleep support, I've never heard the sleep stuff, to antioxidant-rich formulations, tart cherry extract contains a phytochemical-rich profile well-suited to a range of product innovations. Uh, this jumped into sort of the front burner for me because when I was in Minnesota teaching, one of the researchers up there, Gary, he was feeding uh, tart cherry to people after eccentric exercise. He got them rocked with you know negatives, very sore, and he would look at different all kinds of markers, antioxidant effects, subjective things like soreness, performance effects. And he was finding some interesting, mild, but interesting enhancements to muscle recovery. So I thought that was cool. Here it says tart cherries are naturally rich in flavonoids, uh, high concentrations of uh, procyanidins and anthocyanins, uh, as well as various antioxidant properties. So here's a white paper by NutriScience Labs, Inc. that looks at the science behind it. So if you're interested, maybe just Google Natural Products and Cider Tart Cherry. It looks like you could just download it. It's just a free. Now, there's, it's commercially backed. So, you know, you take anything like this, I guess, with a grain yeah. of salt. But like Dr. Nelson said earlier, just because it's sponsored by a company that sells it doesn't mean it's false or fabricated. Right. So, uh, yeah. So it's interesting as far as exercise recovery. Uh, and like I said, I'd never seen anything about sleep. Inflammation and recovery? Sure. So I don't know hmm. if, if anybody's interested. You're sore all the time. You feel like your recovery sucks. There you go. Maybe some tart cherry, and, and this is a white paper. It's sort of a, a literature review uh, from NutriScience Labs. Interesting. Okay. Well, there you have it. That's a, some uh, different types of, not so much mail, a little bit of email. Some of it was just social media, whatnots. Uh, a little bit of science. And then we're going to go to break now. When we come back, we're going to talk about good genetics for what? Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. I can't stop feeling some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this land. Hi, listeners. This is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. 
Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or click the donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org, and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, everyone, we're back. Uh, it's uh, Mike and Lonnie this time, and we're going to talk about genetics. Before I do, let me quickly offer a few thanks here. We are in the middle of our fall funds drive, right? So Iron Radio is listener-supported. We've got that public radio-esque kind of model. So thanks to the uh, new supporters, Stephen, Sandy, Kurt, and Stuart. Uh, appreciated. You are appreciated. Uh, also, long timers, because that's very important, right? That we recognize people that are part of the Iron Brotherhood. So, Christopher, Doug, and Joe, and Joseph. So Joe times two, unless Joseph, you don't like being called Joe, but you know, you guys, <laughs> you guys have a feel for who you are. Again, we're trying to be respectful, not throwing out last names and you know addresses and <laughs> social security numbers. Uh, so. <laughs> But thanks, guys. Uh, again, the fall drive, you know, it's a time where people start to give to their favorite things. And I actually support some certain other podcasts and charities. Like I was just talking about the, the coffee festival that went to a charity. And so put your money where your interests are and support things that are good. So, so thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. That's awesome. Appreciate the support. All right, let's talk about genes because in the gym you often hear stuff like he's got good genes, she's got bad bad genes or good genes or or what have you. So we're going to talk about for what because there's lots of obviously structures and systems in your body that are driven, they're underwritten by your parental choice, <laughs> as it were. So uh, one of them I think is most obvious, at least it jumps into my mind as a former bodybuilder, uh, is, is for proportion, right? For what a lot of people erroneously call symmetry. So sym- symmetry, of course, just means the left side looks just like the right side. But when bodybuilders say symmetry, they mean proportion and shape, right? So uh, there are some obvious examples of muscles, I think, that are genetically driven. Like one is calf insertion. You know, like calf mm-hmm. calf length. Like I, there's a guy at the gym. He wins a lot of local and regional events. He's jacked, 
but his calves insert about three inches below the popliteal space behind his knee. And I'm Ooh, thinking, oh, man, bastard. like you got little <laughs> walnuts back there. I don't care how big your pecs are or your guns. If I was a judge, I, I would vote you very poorly. Now, now, don't get me wrong. If There's got to be some balance. If everybody else yeah. in the lineup is they're, they're not even bodybuilder looking, yeah, then maybe hit that huge chest and arms that he's got going is enough to pull him ahead of a nobody. But, you know, I I like that classic X-frame kind of look. You know, your calves. Uh, th there's an old, like, Greek ideal we used to talk about. The calves should be the same size as your biceps and as, and, as your neck. So, like, 18-inch neck, 18-inch arms, 18-inch calves. And someone like that, you know, I'm not sure he has much hope. And it, it almost brings up sort of the, the controversy is, should someone like that be allowed to have an implant? Because there's no amount of work that he can do to have big calves, right? Or, or at least deep, long calves. So, so that goes into judging, right? So how much do you mark someone down for something like that, even though they're not at the standard, but yet, like you mentioned, it's not 100% under their control either. Yep. But you know what? Sometimes you just... if. It's like basketball. Like, I'm 5'9". I'm not going to be delusional that I can go up, yeah. <laughs> you know, to the upper echelons. Of I know there have been short, some short guys that did well in basketball, but and I'm okay with that. So I'm going to follow my strengths, right? So I think that's the best thing you can do probably is what are you good at and then develop that, you know. And so I was never a very big person, but I did have sort of that proportional look. And I honestly, I think that's what's great about strength and muscle sports is that if you're – this behemoth of a man and you're six foot nine and you weigh 400 pounds hey strong man might be calling your name you know yeah. but when you're five nine and you barely weigh 200 pounds you can still make a kick-ass bodybuilder if you're if you have good shape you know you're you have cappy shoulders you don't have sloped shoulders you've got the calves and you know, you know all that sort of thing you don't have super high biceps insertions or you know, whatever so proportion is definitely one um, but there are others, right? So before we hit the record button, everybody, Mike and I were talking about things like tendon insertion. So there's some great diagrams in some of the, like the NSCA's uh, key textbook. Uh, and it, it, it's sort of classroom-esque material here, but if your tendons insert lower down the lever arm, so lower down, let's say, your tibia or something like that, then you will be stronger because you're actually tugging on the bone lower down and you can be very strong. The flip side of that is you could lose a little bit of angular velocity. And I'm not going to explain this in gory detail, but if you're, it, you'd be a little slower. So maybe a little less athletic or fast, but you'd make a kick-ass bodybuilder, right? So there could be a trade-off. And again, it's kind of that go with your, your strengths or like hand size, it would be another one, like skeletal size, right? Eddie Cohn was so awesome and stuff like the deadlift because although he's not tall, uh, as I understand it, he's got really big hands for his mm. frame. And that's got to be really good for holding on to a very, very heavy deadlift bar, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think of, uh, I saw him again a couple of weeks ago, Brad Gillingham, who's pulled multiple deadlifts over 800 pounds, you know, drug tested and, Man, his hands are just huge. Not only is he just a big dude structure-wise, but his hands are just massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not just big, but meaty, like a meatloaf. Yes, you know, sausage. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have small-ish hands. They're not tiny. Not like uh, you know, um, President Trump hands or something like that. <laughs> but people are always laughing about that. But but when I shake these guys, yeah, some of these big dudes. Yeah, like uh, I've shake. I, I think I've shaken hands with Brad before, or like um, Kaz, like at the Arnold Classic mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm like, I feel like I'm I'm shaking a catcher's mitt. You know, I'm like, yep. this is ridiculous, dude. Like, wow. So yeah, yeah, and I mean, but now you do strength, specifically grip training, grip strength. Um, obviously, big hands must be a big deal in that, right? Uh, for the most part, they are. I mean, you'll see like a lot of like some of the top uh, strong men, you know, do pretty well in grip without a lot of direct training. Sometimes, like uh, uh, Mark Felix and 
Uh, JL Holsworth has, you know, done some very impressive grip stuff and deadlifts and stuff like that, too. Um, and then you also see very interesting exceptions, which goes back to your genetics talk. Another guy here locally, man, I don't think he weighed more than maybe 160 pounds. I mean, you know, obviously it looked like he trained, but, you know, and the stuff he did for grip was, like, super impressive. Um, my buddy uh, Adam Glass probably weighs probably still under 200 now and he's competed at the you know the arnold uh, mighty mitts you know against guys who outweighed him by 100 pounds and did better than them that's cool you know? yeah so yeah so a lot of training there's some genetics too and you know guys like adam have you know been very strong but he's also spent you know almost a decade and a half of just dedicated training towards that too so right so there could be other genes at work right that combined with his tra- grip strength training, yeah. you know, that allow him to do that. Again, tendon insertions, whatever. But yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and even on Adam, it's interesting because I've known him for ten years now. To see the hypertrophy in his tendons and even in his wrist, like his wrist and hands and everything looks different now than it did like ten years ago. Oh, see, you know, yeah. You don't really think of like those structures getting bigger, right? But if you apply those massive loads to them day in and day out for you know a better part of it more than a decade you know there's going to be some hypertrophy there too yeah no that's a good point i've actually noticed uh, when i w- weighed a lot more um my watch was always very tight and i ha- actually had the same watch and now it's sort of loose on my wrist because i mean that's just my wrist you think well that's just bone you know but no they're like you said it might be slow turnover but the it's not just actin and myosin in a muscle belly that's changing when you hypertrophy, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. All right, let me ask you about this. What about performance-enhancing drugs? Where would genes come into play with that? What do you think? Yeah, I think all sorts of stuff. I mean, like we talked about before the show, your ability to not get sort of toxic side effects from them. Mm-hmm. You know, because we all hear these horror stories of you know people who take massive amounts of stuff but you know go to get their blood checked and everything else it generally appears to be pretty good you know then you've got just the overall response to it you know you hear this you know stories of people taking a fair amount of stuff and yeah doesn't seem to do much you know other people take a fraction of that and look amazingly different right you know, even um like dory nates has been in a couple of interviews now and and basically had an article in muscular development probably a year and a half ago now or longer and just told everyone, here's exactly what I took. Here's what I took. Here's the amount. I know it was legit. And yeah, it was, I wouldn't say mm, that high really. I mean, nowhere close to what, you know, people are rumored to be doing now. Um, so it's, it's, I think you just see a huge range in that from one person to the next. Yeah, I like what you're saying about, on one side, it's resistance to drug side effects. I don't think the yeah. lay person thinks about that. Like, you could, if you have really good genes to redu- to resist drug side effects, like the gynecomastia and bitch tips, if you will, from, you know, mm-hmm. or a swollen prostate and you can't pee, or, I mean, you could just go down, a, you know, cystic acne, uh, stretch marks. It could be almost anything. Uh, that'd be more minor, that last one. But you get my point is that, yeah, yeah, people who can resist can take what I would consider national caliber or world-class doses, you know, multi-gram amounts of androgens, you know, 12 IUs of GH every day, and a, a cool. lot of these different things, um, and not have signs and symptoms of different kinds of illness or even stuff like GH belly, uh, whatever yeah. it might be. Their head doesn't look different. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So it's again that's so bizarre to think of it that way but yeah you could have good genes to resist drugs and then like you said on the flip side is some people they respond to meds very readily so they can take fairly low amounts and and again before we were recording everyone um there was a local guy uh who was apparently on all kinds of stuff, and he just never looked like much. You know, he had sort of a, a C minus caliber physique, and and my I remember my brother at the time. He's like, that guy's on all kinds of shit. Poor bastard's got no receptors. You know, that's what he said. And, <laughs> and I thought, oh, but I, there's some truth in that, right? That sound that's mm-hmm. so crass, but that's there's some truth in that. So, uh, 
yeah, some people respond like crazy because I don't know, uh, some I don't know if it's receptor density or or whatever it is, but they just respond like crazy, and yeah, so there's a sensitivity issue there genetically too. So so far we're, we we got muscle shape and proportion, we've got tendinous insertions, we've got you know uh, response, uh, good or bad to performance enhancing meds, um, and there's even diet, right? So. If you look at the literature, and I don't have anything in front of me, I really should, but I, listeners, trust me, if you go look, you will see that people respond to lower cal diets differently, right? Just like people respond to mm -hmm. different carbohydrate intakes differently, and it's not always just training. I mean, the difficult thing with this whole genetic discussion is epigenetics, of course, right? You have yeah. environmental lifestyle pressures on your genes that turn some on and off and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, some people can diet and they maintain some of the hormones that you might hope to maintain, like, you know, uh, leptin and thyroid, like T3, uh, your more active thyroid. They, they're they better at the low-cal diet. So when they do diet, they don't get the munchies as bad. They don't lose muscle mass as bad, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I know you work with all kinds of clients, Mike, and some of them are competitive. Do you see a huge what you would suspect genetic difference in in their response to diets and how do you how do you tweak yeah it's you see everything across the map um semi related to is carbohydrate tolerance mm -hmm. you know i've worked with uh the smaller uh, female competitor who you know competed at an extremely high you know a drug tested national show did really well you know she was at you know, mid 200 grams of carbohydrates a couple of weeks out, you know, and she was up to in the 300s in the off season. And I've worked with some guys who never get past 300, even, even in the off season weighing, you know, maybe a hundred pounds more. Um, and then on the, the flip side with that too, when you're talking about reducing calories, you know, kind of reverse dieting is very popular, which I think there's you know, some good anecdotal data to support that. Um, you know, Lane Norton's talked a lot about that, Cliff Wilson, other guys. And I think, yeah, by all means, you know, classic old school, getting your calories higher in the off season, probably carbohydrates. I think that's that's good. That's been done for decades. What I think people forget then is the rate that how much you may have to drop them to get leaner, right? So some people, they think, oh my God, I got up to 350 grams of, you know, carbohydrates off season man, my diet is going to be a breeze. This is going to be so easy. But then they forget that, well, maybe you have to drop them more aggressively in order to get to where you want to go, right? So maybe within a couple months, you're already down to you know, 180 grams or something, right? That The rate of your response isn't always the same either. So it's not just the number you get to, it's the because you at the end of the day have to equate that for the response right or the rate of loss so that becomes kind of tricky you know other people may only get up to 200 but yeah you know you don't have to cut them that often you know they're i try to do the, the minimal amount possible which sometimes is harder from a psychological side right because people kind of want to be kind of uber aggressive but it's like, hey, if you're doing well and you're losing weight and everything is good, I'm probably not going to make any changes. Because if we start getting too aggressive, you're basically just going to run out of space, right? And when you've eaten chicken breast and lettuce, you know, for months on end, that's not going to be good. No, so, agreed. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that we don't have enough data on it, but I've, I've wondered a lot if that's a genetic thing. Uh, we do know that, like, looking at the overfeed, overfeed studies from Levine, you mm -hmm. know, with uh, the NEAT, so non-exercise activity thermogenesis, you just overfeed some people and they spontaneously just start walking and moving and twitching and doing all these other things to burn off more calories. And then on the flip side, you've got the same thing, right? So some people, you start cutting their calories a little bit and their external movement just drops like a stone, right? right? Yeah. So I like using a Fitbit and at least trying to quantify the number of steps per day you know, so that they don't go from 10,000 steps a day to 6,000. You're going, oh, but we cut your calories by this amount. I don't understand why you're not losing, you know. So right. I think there's probably a high amount of genetics 
epigenetics that are involved in that process too yeah you're really good with monitoring as many things as possible i mean when i used to do yeah. weight, like weight management stuff for non-athletes back in the day like old school pedometers yeah i would try to keep some eye on how much yeah. that they are moving around because like you said you pull the calories out and then just i don't know if you call it like behavioral homeostasis or metabolic yeah. or whatever yeah they all of a sudden they stop moving and so they're actually not in the negative calorie balance you thought they were in you know yeah. you're walking they were walking 8 10,000 steps a day 8 to 10 now they're work, now they're moving around like 3,000 i'm you're like well crap right cuz they're non exercise physical activity neat or nipa or whatever mm -hmm. yeah is changing right so i i don't know from a genetic perspective um, working with your blueprint and that sort of thing. I mean, let's face it, the Human Genome Project did not solve disease in the way that I think maybe some of us hoped. No. Uh, so, and it's because of the, again, environmental pressures. People talk about nature versus nurture all the time, but epigenetics is that science, right? It is the link. It's the environmental pressures that you're putting on your blueprint to turn off and on parts of it, right? And we're not gonna go on about methylation and histones and all this stuff, but there, there's, this is real, everybody. The nature-nurture argument, it's not one or the other. The, it, nurture, or your lifestyle, puts pressure on the nature of your blueprint. So I, other than like bioassays, kind of like what we're talking about, like trying a diet for a sufficient amount of time, not just a couple of weeks, but maybe a couple of months, are you doing better on the low carb diet? Are you doing better on the low fat diet? You can get some hints about genetics by like family history. That's old school like nutrition mm -hmm. dietetic stuff. Like if you have a family history of type two diabetes, I don't know, there's like a 60 or 80% genetic link there that even if you don't have diabetes yourself, if you've got relatives with type two diabetes, you might actually be a poor carbohydrate metabolizer yourself, right? So family history, uh, and then your obvious responses, your body composition or performance monitoring, those are ways that you can kind of at least figure out genetically what you're more about. And age is a confounder with all this too, right? Because middle-aged people like myself, I can't, or Dr. Nelson, uh, we can't eat probably the amount of carbohydrates we did when we were 20. You know, that kind of thing. You start to have a little bit of fading there too, but... I would think between family history and then giving yourself sufficient durations on different diets, you can start to get an idea about where you are geared um, genetically when it comes to the diet and genes, I suppose. Yeah, and that's why I like looking at you know heart rate variability, which is a marker for stress and performance and different metrics like that, right? Because you can kind of – so like for myself, I do – better on a little bit higher carbohydrate diet and lower fat in general um because for me carbohydrates are more effective at kind of buffering stress so if i go on a super low carb diet my stress tends to go up much higher um even when i've kind of cut back on training a little bit i don't know why that is maybe it's a underlying stress or something like that or insulin modifying cortisol or who knows right but I have other clients who are kind of the inverse. You know, they do better on what I would say is a little bit higher fat, definitely not a ketogenic type fat, but, you know, pushing you know, 80 to 100 grams per day. And their carbs are you know, moderate-ish and proteins, you know, kind of moderate to high. You know, so I think there is a, a fair amount of, of variation in that too. Yeah. It, that's funny This you say that because I became so carb paranoid uh kind of traditional bodybuilder thinking, right, that you pull carbs out to compete, right? If, you're, oh, if yeah. your protein's fairly constant throughout the year, and arguably even your fat, uh, it's the carbohydrate surplus or deficit that people are modifying a lot. But, yeah, I've actually found that I can't just cut carbs real, real low. Uh, you, I like what you said about sort of anxiety or sort of the stress background and mm -hmm. HRV, and I'm really just getting to the HRV more myself. Um, as you know, because of some of the projects yeah. that I'm doing at the, at the university. But yeah, I can't, if I don't have like my morning oatmeal and some carbohydrates at lunch and like I've lost 25 pounds since last year and my weight's continuing to go down. So I'm like, I need to put some carbs back in, but part of that fat loss and I've lost a ton of fat, but was from pulling some fat out of my diet. Like I am not the kind of person 
like you often hear the fitness and bodybuilder uh, competitors talk like, oh, go higher fat and just blame carbs. I can't do that. <laughs> I've actually got to pull some fat or I don't get leaner, right? So it's, again, it, you're teasing apart how much of this is genes versus age and everything else and, and the way you train. I mean, let's face it. If I'm not training with the amount of glycogen depleting intensity that I used to either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something that comes into play as well. So. Lots of issues, yeah. I guess, uh, with genes, and I, I just thought we might explore that, right? Because I don't know how much powerlifters talk about genes or strongmen, but bodybuilders talk about, you know, he's, he's got good genes all the time. And I thought it'd be good to talk about genes for what? Like, which system, which structure, you know, and, then, and what, what comes into play with getting those genes activated and, or not. So Yeah, the last thing on that, too, is that you've got the classic, uh, responder versus non-responder, which I think has been probably overplayed a little bit. But I was just talking to Stu Phillips recently, and I remember that I was telling him that one of the first talks I ever saw with him, uh, Dave Barr was there too, I think. It was like 2008 or 2006 ACSM. And he put up this graph of a training study they did. You know, and most of the people right in the middle – there was one poor bastard who actually got slightly weaker and smaller, you know, statistically speaking, not, you know, realistically, not by that much. And two other guys were like way at the top, like almost, you know, outliers on it, you know. And so then they started looking at the you know, effects of testosterone and other things like that. And you look at um, extreme responders, the separate groups looked at that. So it's just, yeah, interesting how... And you hear stories, right? I know Fortress has told us multiple stories of certain pros who will be left unnamed would just go to the gym and you'd watch their training and you'd be like, what the hell? And they're just huge. You know, it just seemed like just putting in enough tension on the muscle and they just get bigger. You know, and other people are you know, kind of doing all sorts of different things. And a lot of times training what we would consider pretty correctly or what we believe to be correctly. And it's just you know, a very, very slow process for him, you know? Yeah. Even body part specific, it could be whole body. Yeah. I had a, a buddy uh, years ago, a uh, bodybuilder, and his arms just weren't very big. And he's like, I, I, I've tried volume, I've tried weight, I do negatives, you know, I'm doing everything I can. And he, he just, he really couldn't get his arms to grow, you know? And so it, it could have been genes for, I don't know, the, the base number of actual maybe muscle fibers that he had. I don't know. It could have been um, genetics for hormones. You know, like for example, if he was very high cortisol all the time, that might be kind of hard to build your arms because it's so catabolic to the periphery like that. And I don't know, right? So yeah, it's it's hard to tease apart, but I, I don't know. It's a fun exploration, I think, to, to talk about for what, because yeah, there's lots of things that you could have a ge genetic advantage for uh, and it's kind of good to at least know that that blueprint and that system is at work, you know, in, in different yeah. ways, different ways. Yeah, and the body part stuff, I've often wondered if that's also related to a nervous system recruitment issue. You know, like if someone has very small lats, is there something going on with the way that they're programmed for their nervous system or old injuries or daily habits or something where they can just not activate as much muscle tissue there for some reason, right? Is it pulling across a joint that the body thinks is not up to par, so it's not going to let you kind of destroy yourself as much? Or Yeah, I don't know. That's always fascinated me. Right on. All cool. right, everyone. Yeah, cool. Well, there's a little news, um, mail, stuff from around the web, and then a little bit of uh, chit-chat about genes, maybe food for thought as you head into the gym and have your own gym talks. So uh, we'll catch up with everyone next time and get some reports from Phil from his big meet. See you. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store. One for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store, uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's 
Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.